everyone uh, watching and in the room, Oxford Try is Nick Wimbledon Smith. <laughs> so we will <laughs> kick off now. Thanks. We've got the whole panel. So welcome to our open forum on strengthening the multi-stakeholder collaboration on DNS abuse. Um, my name is Rowena Shu. I work for the DNS Abuse Institute, which was set up by Public Interest Registry. Um, I won't go into too much of what we do in terms of our activities on this panel. There's another lightning session later today if you'd like to learn more about that. Um, this panel is here to DNS abuse, uh, what it is, what acting at the DNS layer means, um, when it's appropriate, and how the multi-stakeholder model fits into that. Um, we're really trying to make this accessible, and so I'm going to ask everybody to try to refrain from using acronyms as much as possible. Uh, when you do use them, just explain what they mean for the context for people who might not be aware. So I'll start us off with DNS. So DNS is the domain name system. It is a name tool that is uh, used to navigate the internet. Um, it is probably one of the only centralized components of the global internet infrastructure system. Um, and that centralization involves a multi-stakeholder policy making organization called ICANN. Um, ICANN is where different groups from different parts of uh, the community come together. And a lot of the people you see here on this panel today are involved in that policy making process. They represent different constituencies. Um, and I just want to note that for the context of this panel, they're generally talking in their personal capacity rather than the groups within ICANN that they represent, um, unless they state otherwise while they're talking. So one other thing to understand about the structure of ICANN is that there's a distinction between country code, top level domains, which are also referred to as TLDs or CCTLDs, and generic top level domains, so GTLDs. That distinction is important because it um, influences how policies are made for those different types of uh, registry operators. So the country codes are much more uh, independent and they make uh, policies aligned to their national jurisdictional expectations, but they often use a, um, a form of multi-stakeholder policy to do that. Um, the GTLDs are bound by the policies that are made with ICANN through that multi-stakeholder model. So without uh, further ado, I think I'll introduce the panel briefly. And then we'll kick off with the first question, which is going to be, what does DNS abuse look like? Um, so joining me on the call today, I have a really excellent panel to help us discuss this. So uh, I have Faz Nabadi, who is the founder of Digital Medusa. I have Sam Demetrio, who uh, works for VeriSign, who run .com. Uh, and she's also the chair of the registry stakeholder group within ICANN. I have Manal Ismail, who is the, who's from the National Telecommunications Regulatory Authority and also um, from the government advice, the GAC, I'm going to try not to use acronyms, the um, government, I can't remember what it stands for, but where the government people hang out in ICANN. Governmental Advisory not. Committee. That's right. <laughs> Um, I've got Chris Lewis Evans from the UK National Crime Agency, um, who tends to hang out in the Public Safety Working Group in ICANN, the PSWG, where law enforcement um, are represented. And I've got Nick Wemben Smith from Nominate UK, who run the .UK country code, um, and also uh, is part of the DNS Abuse Standing Committee for the country code uh, group within ICANN. Right, let's get started with our, our first question. I'm going to turn to Nick first to give us a bit of a short overview on what does DNS abuse look like? Um, thanks so much, Rowena, for that introduction. Um, so it is an interesting topic, I think, because if you look at lots of registries, so you say, for example, the .uk registry, you won't find much reference to DNS abuse anywhere, but you will find a lot of policies which probably cover what most people would understand certainly to be DNS abuse. So, for example, example um, providing accurate registration data, 
um, not fishing, fraud, all of those sorts of policies would be prohibited. Uh, people have tried to encompass the definition, and I think the reasons it's, it's sort of so focused on the definitional um, is because if we're talking about DNS abuse, the, I think the abuse of the DNS does speak to the infrastructure, and it's the sort of abuse that infrastructure providers would be expected to intervene on. Um, but it's quite a controversial area because I think most um, most most people would consider, say, for example, um, dissemination of child abuse images to be um, abusive and something that res responsible registry operators would would take action on. But it's obviously a content issue as opposed to um, part of the technical function. So this is where you get into the very difficult areas of discussion around definitional what should infrastructure providers be acting on in terms of responsible um, industry participation in terms of the overall safety and um, uh, good reputation of, um, of, of, of the registries. I think, I suppose, my final opening observation would be, um, I think a lot of us who work in the infrastructure would understand abuse when we see it. Sometimes it's not that easy to work out the right intervention, if any. Um, however, I think a lot of this would be largely characterized as essentially if you are running a good registry, having good registry policies and good operational practices, then the levels of abuse you should see de facto should be should be lower than than um, than, than otherwise. And I think that's my main point about avoiding DNS abuse is about operating good infrastructure. Thanks. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, so I think you're sort of starting to touch on a, a theme that I see coming up in various different forums where we're discussing this, which is around um, the term DNS abuse often being used as shorthand for whether or not action at the DNS level is appropriate. Um, so I, which is which is an interesting question, and we're going to dive more into that as we talk about mitigation. I'm, I'm going to turn to Fazana next to say. I believe you wanted to come in here and talk a little bit about this distinction we see with um, content and technical abuse. Uh, yeah, thank you. So um, my name is Paris Uh So for the, when we talk about DNS abuse, it is very important to understand and know which context we are talking about. If we are uh, at an organization like ICANN, which is Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, which is in, in charge of allocation of uh, domain names and uh, assist, uh, and the security of the of the DNS, then it is important to uh, know that uh, there are like some limits as to what DNS abuse means there. So um, uh, and our efforts to define DNS abuse has been futile be because of, um, well, I'm going to mention um, later on about like uh, some of the shortcomings of this multi-stakeholder model. But um, for, for us to kind of like have an understanding of what DNS abuse is, uh, we need to make a distinction between uh, when the DNS is used, DNS as, a, as an infrastructure is used, to carry out a technical attack or when the um, uh, or when the registration of domain names are uh, and uh, and they're like hosting hostings that are used to do social harm and it is not uh, only about content i i would like to suggest that we uh, kind of frame the uh, the latter, the content and uh, service uh, abuse as a trust and safety issue. And based on this kind of model, uh, for example, if, if, I, if I use the uh, DNS as a protocol, uh, as a protocol in infrastructure to carry out a technical attack, it is a little bit easier than like solving that, that than uh, solving a social um, and a legal issue that has like multiple uh, jurisdictional uh, uh, difficulties. Uh, so that's it for me, for now. For me. Thank you very much, Fazana. So um, some really interesting points in that around what 
uh, sort of mitigation is appropriate depending on what type of harm you're seeing within that uh, bucket of DNS abuse. Um, yeah, I, th I think the, the definition point is interesting and I, I will sort of challenge us to think about whether we need a definition of DNS abuse in order to move forward on this issue or what we need is actually having some clarity of what we're talking about between us, whether that's focusing on a specific issue like phishing or child abuse, and then looking at what kind of um, actions can be taken around that. Okay, so I am going to go next to Chris, the so sevens. Yeah, thanks, Rowena, and uh, hi, everyone. So um, from a law enforcement perspective, um, we, we don't categorise DNS abuse as a as, as an entity, as a um, crime type. So, you know, what we look at is is the harm that has been caused um, by um, uh, the activity carried out. So whether someone's clicked on a link um, that they've trusted because it has a, a, a sort of trusted look to it, and then they've suffered a personal data loss, and then that leaves them open to extortion or whether that's caused them distress through the types of personal data they've lost. So from that, we would record uh, based on the actual you know, impact on the victim there. Um, you know, and that there's many other ways that um, victims uh, can be harmed in this manner, you know, whether it's businesses allowing different um, TTLDs that have been compromised or domains that have been compromised within TTLDs because they trust those. Um, and then lost, you know, significant amounts of money. So, you know, we could categorize that as some form of um, sort of business email compromise. Um, and it's how we categorize them is not necessarily that important. Categorize the, you know, uh, methods that have been used to, to harm. It's the actual effect on the person that has been harmed is, is really important for us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, and some, some really interesting points in there. We're, we're sort of touching on the next question, which is around um, what acting at the DNS layer means. So I'm gonna turn now to Sam to uh, both give any responses to what's come up and also to uh, think about the next question around what DNS le um, level action means. Kick us off, Sam. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Rowena. And hi, everyone. Um, so I'm really glad Rowena laid out sort of the definition of, of the domain name system at the top of this uh, session. I think it's what's crucial to remember is that the DNS is a tool that allows internet users to connect to content, but it is not content itself. It's separate from the content that lives on um, websites or other you know parts of the internet. And so when we talk about this question of how to define DNS abuse um, and you know how to characterize it and how to really start to wrap our arms around and tackle this issue, the reason I think it, it becomes so difficult to nail something down is because the process of acting at the DNS layer is often a very blunt tool. Um, when you act at that level, um, if as an infrastructure provider, as, as Nick kind of laid out, that often entails suspending or taking down or deleting the entire domain name, which means taking down all the content and the services that use that domain name. So all of the websites, um, all of the email content, um, email servers, everything that's associated with and uses that domain name. So when we talk about DNS abuse within the context of ICANN and registries and registrars who participate within ICANN, we adopt a pretty narrow definition of DNS abuse that covers a handful of technical harms. So specifically malware, phishing, farming, botnets, and spam when it's used as a delivery mechanism for those other four types of abuse. Obviously that definition doesn't encompass all of the harmful activity that happens online. Chris has mentioned a few, Nick has mentioned a few. Um, but we sort of see it more as a starting point um, for what DNS infrastructure providers can work on within their kind of remit and their responsibility and their role within the larger internet ecosystem, um, and specifically 
within the, the domain name system. And I think this really underscores the whole point of this panel, right? And I know Farzane is going to get into this a little bit later, right? Which is understanding the role of multi-stakeholderism and all of the different actors who have to come together to appropriately address the different kinds of harms that happen online, regardless of kind of how you set that definition, right? There's obviously a role for infrastructure providers like registries and registrars, as well as like, you know, hosting providers, email providers, content delivery networks to play. But then there's a wider group of service providers who are probably better suited to address other types of, of harms in the online space. So um, I think that's really kind of sets the stage at, of like how acting at the DNS infrastructure level is maybe appropriate for certain types of harms, but not necessarily everything that gets encompassed when people talk about abuse online. And that's why the definition question becomes so important because it, um, I think it really raises the question of like how you set expectations around like what you can require for different parties in that in, in that ecosystem and like what roles each and responsibilities each party plays in mitigating the different types of harms online. Thanks very much, Sam. Some really important points in there. Um, so we, we often talk about registries and registrars having quite a limited toolbox in terms of what levers they can pull when there, there is an issue of something happening um, and that those levers are quite blunt. Um, and probably one distinction that I maybe should have set out at the start as well is the concept around um, malicious or compromised. So often when something happens on a domain name, it could either be like entirely related to why that domain name was registered or it could only be a part of that. So often a registry operator will need to be thinking about the potential collateral damage. So if they were to use one of those blunt tools, as Sam was saying, that would stop a lot of other services uh, associated with that domain from functioning as well, which could have other harms for, for society more broadly. Um, so I'm going to turn now to the rest of the panel to respond to some of these remarks. Um, Nanal, we haven't uh, heard from you yet. Would you like to come in here? I've got you down for interventions later as well, so um, no worries if you if you don't want to. Uh, Okay, um, anyone else want to respond to what Sam has brought up here? Fazna, Nick, Chris. <laughs> if if no, I'll I'll have a extend an open invitation to the panel. We um on responding to what uh what Sam has said around when what it means to act at the DNS level. Um, but if no one wants to come in, then we can move on to our next question, which is around uh, um, where is appropriate. Have... Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. Just, just wanted to. So Sam uh, mentioned something that uh, I think is really important, and we kind of like uh, disregarded in our conversations. Um, a lot of the times, uh, when uh, when we are tackling the DNS abuse issues, we are there are multiple actors involved. That uh, sometimes the registries and, and registrars um, cannot uh, tackle uh, the issue, and that they have to like work with other actors who might not uh, necessarily be cooperative. So basically, um, and we don't have those actors, um, like we need to, I, I think that INJ Internet Jurisdiction uh, Project has actually mapped out those uh, other actors, like hosting providers and others that um, need to be like, we need to talk to them as well. And we need to have them at the table so that we don't have a, like we don't expect the registries and registrars and those that we necessarily have contracts with them at ICANN to do things that they cannot technically do. Thanks, Fazna. Very important point there around um, this quite complex ecosystem where there are lots of different parties involved with different um, abilities to take different action. Um, and they're not always in the room and, and many of those aren't indeed part of the ICANN structure. Um, 
any other responses from the panel on these points? Just come off mute if you would like to speak. Otherwise, we'll, we'll move on to when we think it's appropriate to act at the DNS level. And I'll, I'll turn to Manal and Chris for those comments. Um, thank you very much, Rowena. And uh, apologies, I had a, an issue unmuting uh, earlier, but glad I managed to unmute now. And uh, I'll use maybe my uh, part in also reflecting on what uh, Sam has uh, mentioned. Um, so uh, with the growth of the use um, uh, of the internet and the reliance on the internet, particularly with the pandemic flagging a new era of global uh, connectivity, uh, this growth in usage is accompanied by uh, multiplied risks and increase in abuse and also growing uh, cybersecurity concerns and such global connectivity poses uh, jurisdictional and uh, cross-border legal challenges. Um, so uh, if we take a cross-border request uh, for domain name suspension as an example, and, and this is what uh, Fersana was just referring to as well, this involves several parties, um, a notifier, uh, the individual or entity complaining, uh, a registrant um, who is the owner of the domain name, a hosting provider where the website relevant to this domain is hosted, um, a registrar where the registrant applies for the domain, and the registry um, administering the, the relevant top-level domain, uh, each of which may exist in a different jurisdiction and hence be subject to different laws and regulations. And this transnational nature of the internet makes it increasingly challenging, especially for governments to solve uh, problems, uh, uh, to solve global problems at the national level through traditional uh, national legal tools. Um, so um, accordingly, governments uh, also being concerned about the public interest, uh, they prioritize curbing DNS abuse and uh, try to urge different parties involved to um, assume their responsibilities and carry out their obligations in mitigating DNS abuse. Um, so governments have been um, advocating, for example, in the ICANN ecosystem for appropriate uh, due diligence by all actors to address malicious activities involving the DNS. And this debate is intensifying, uh, particularly in the light of the introduction of new GTLDs. Uh, with a focus on what constitutes DNS abuse. And again, this uh, comes back to the definition, what is or is not in the scope of responsibilities of ICANN and the registries and registrars, whether the registries and registrars have the appropriate tools and uh, whether ICANN contractual provisions are effective in mitigating uh, DNS abuse. Um, that said, uh, it's also important to note that acting at the DNS level, as Sam mentioned, also um, should be considered when it is effective and proportionate, uh, because the domain name suspension has global impact and may result in collateral and unintended consequences. Uh, also, not to mention the risk of false positives as well. Um, and it is um, uh, particularly important to uh, not uh, rely on uh, acting at the DNS level uh, as an easy solution to address abusive uh, content issues, uh, which is, of course, acting at the DNS level um, is, would be more appropriate and effective in addressing uh, technical abuse. And again, um, I think uh, Sam already went through the listing of this. Um, but uh, again, as, uh, as also uh, Chris mentioned, um, governments are concerned about the harm caused uh, by uh, DNS abuse, uh, which sometimes extend to uh, problematic content uh, where we find a higher degree of shared agreement across jurisdictions. Um, and this um, includes uh, child abuse material, for example, uh, among others, of course. Uh, I'll stop here not to exceed my time, but in conclusion, it's essential to have an agreed process in place. And this mandates uh, a multi-stakeholder dialogue uh, 
uh, coordination and cooperation across uh, borders uh, in addition to the national level, of course. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manal. Um, some really important points in there, uh, which I'm sure we will come back to. Um, the, the jurisdictional one is, is also one that comes up a lot. Um, of course, the, uh, there's a big challenge for, for governments when they're trying to enforce national laws and, and they're used to having a, an area of jurisdiction. And now we have this great flattening of the world that's happened through the internet and this patchwork that doesn't always align. Um, I'm sure we'll come back to the contractual provisions too. Um, but I'm going to turn now to Chris, who uh, is going to respond on this, this same question around when you think it's appropriate to act at the DNS level. Yeah, thanks, Rina. So I think, uh, you know, there's some really key points I want to drag out on the uh, time it is appropriate to, to deal through the DNS. And I think uh, Manal highlighted there that many of these instances are multi-jurisdictional. So, you know, the registrant could be in one country, the hosting company could be in country two, uh, the registrar could be in country three, and the victim behind the DNS abuse could be in country four. So immediately when you're trying to deal with that DNS abuse, you, you could be dealing with, you know, four different entities in four different countries. So from a, a law enforcement perspective, being able to take timely action uh, to prevent that abuse from um, continuing or happening to other people, it, it, it can be difficult to to act in a timely manner when you're dealing, you know, with different legislation, different um, actors in different countries. So uh, I think the role certainly for law enforcement, and um, I think we've got some good examples of that, is trying to work with the uh, different entities to provide, you know, evidential based information on the impact of the harm. So appropriate action can be taken at, at the right level. Um, and, and sometimes that has to be escalated um, to taking action at the DNS, even if the most appropriate action might be for the uh, registrant to take some action. You know, if they're in a different time zone, if they can't get in contact with them, then, you know, you, you sort of step up that level of um, action that can be taken. So whether that's up to the hosting level to remove their content uh, from the internet, or whether it's up to the registrar or registry to uh, suspend their domain. And one thing I'd like to flag is whilst takedown sounds really drastic and a, a bit of a sledgehammer, which it is, at, at the end of the day, what we're actually doing is suspending that domain. And, um, you know, we've worked together really well with our, our country co-colleagues. Uh, so uh, just highlighting what Nick said around uh, suspending some domains that might um, be causing harm. But, you know, the registrant has the opportunity to come back and say, yeah, sorry, that's happened. My domain was compromised. Um, and, you know, law enforcement have worked with um, registrants before to provide them advice on how to, to clean up what's happening or to highlight the actual harm uh, or the, you know, the, the code on their uh, domain that's causing the harm. Um, and they're able to clean that up. So once a domain's been suspended, it can be unsuspended. Uh, it, it's not, um, it's gone forever. Um, you know, it's not a, a, a total sledgehammer, shall we say. Um, but so I, I think there's some consideration that needs to be taken around, you know, preventing that harm in, in a timely manner and it's getting that right. So I think uh, uh, just to give an example of that, I think la early last year, the Emotet takedown, um, we had uh, a number of domains that were, were spreading uh, malware. Um, uh, for some of those, we were able to contact the registrant where we were able to get, um, you know, their details either from the website itself or from the sort of who is information. We were able to contact them, provide them advice on how to um, remove the malicious code from their uh, websites. Some others, we weren't able to find out who the registrant was, so we contacted the hosting company um, and able to then to reach out to their customer and act in an appropriate time. Uh, others, we just couldn't get hold of either, whether they were self-hosting or whether the um, hoster was um, 
um, non-responsive. And uh, those ones we had to act with the registrar or the registries um, to be able to spend their domains, to be able to stop uh, the malware being spread. So there is different levels of response. No, one is not always the right answer. And sometimes you have to escalate it. So that's uh, that one. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, some really interesting points in there. Um, particularly, I think this idea of sort of false positives and um, reversal mechanisms is something we should come back to. Um, I'm going to go to Sam next uh, to make an intervention, and then we'll go to Barzana. Yeah, thanks, Aruna. I just I kind of wanted to chime in on a few things that Chris laid out, which is first off that sometimes acting at the DNS layer is absolutely appropriate. Um, I feel like I maybe glossed over that in my introductory remar remarks on uh, the last question, but totally agree with Chris. Um, there's, for example, um, if you look at, like so Chris mentioned, in some cases of malware, in other cases, if you look at botnets that um, use an algorithm to generate domain names really quickly um, that are primarily going to be used, like the whole goal is to use them for abusive purposes, right? There's a good argument to be made about taking action at um, the DNS layer. And VeriSign has some experience with um, not necessarily always suspending those domains, but also an, like another alternative is um, registering them, like understanding the algorithm, getting ahead of it, registering those domains and sinkholing them so that you're able to track the traffic and then um, remediate the issue by figuring out, you know, kind of who the victims are and identify those victims and help uh, resolve the problem that way. Um, but for when a action at the DNS layer is not necessarily the most appropriate, I really wanted to underscore something Chris said, which is the importance of the different relationships between the parties. So relationships between registries and registrars and law enforcement, I think are really critical here, having good open um, channels of communication, even if there's not necessarily a jurisdiction or like a regulatory framework under which that happens, having those lines of communication open, I think can be incredibly helpful. And the relationships between registries and registrars, because registrars are often um, the best place to start with some of these complaints because they have insights into who the registrant of the domain name is, who the customer is, who may be the either the victim or the perpetrator, right, of the of the abuse. Um, and they also end up having relationships with the other providers kind of down the chain, whether that's domain name resellers or hosting providers. So really having those um lines of communication open and having those relationships established and understanding that like when you do have to bring in other parties, additional parties to address and like really hone in on the appropriate one to take action on the specific type of abuse, the most appropriate action, having those um, relationships is absolutely critical, whether it's in a very formal structure like exists in ICANN or a more kind of open free form. <laughs> or freewheeling structure um, that can exist in, in other kind of multi-stakeholder uh, settings and channels. I think ha giving space for those to be established is like absolutely critical in talking about this issue uh, more broadly. Thanks very much, Sam. Uh, I'm going next to Fazana. Thank you. Uh, so I think that uh, we need to mention now um, a very important issue in tackling DNS abuse, we are also uh, dealing with uh, fundamental rights, freedom of expression, um, freedom of assembly. And nowadays, the internet is not just a means for communication. Uh, it is to access essential services online, services that we depend on uh, to uh, do our day-to-day -day tasks. And also, it's not just to better our lives. Sometimes during crisis, we use the internet to save ourselves and others. So um, when if we make mistakes and stop somebody's uh, domain name and suspend it uh, in, when we are tackling abuse, and when we, if we stop, if, we, if it's likely that we stop an actual essential service that people are using, 
then uh, we need to uh, then we need to kind of like consider that and have the right processes in place in order to prevent that. So due process, while it's very important to have some kind of recourse to um, kind of get uh, after your domain name is uh, suspended to uh, get it unsuspended, uh, we also need to focus a lot on how we prevent uh, false positive from happening because we are now talking about our fundamental rights and access to essential services. Uh, and uh, so this, this is why I think that as well as thinking about uh, due process and uh, like having a recourse mechanism for when your domain name is um, suspended, uh, we should also have uh, processes that prevents us uh, from making mistakes. Uh, so it's not, uh, as you know, Chris, it's not that easy. <laughs> so uh, so it's, I'm just saying that it is not enough to just provide them with due process. Now, also another point that I wanted to make on something that Sam said about cooperation in an informal way. Um, we need to also be wary of uh, law enforcement. I mean, law enforcement most of the time does great work, but uh, sometimes law enforcement um, can be, without the right processes, can violate the rule of law themselves um, and uh, can like violate human rights. And so we need to have processes in place for those cooperation now, formal, informal, I, I don't know, I don't know if I necessarily agree with law enforcement cooperating informally uh, with others, uh, but uh, if there are informal cooperations as well, we need some minimum, uh, minimum procedure for how they are doing this, how many, how many requests they have, uh, uh, they have made, and uh, so that we can actually keep tab on this and uh, hold them accountable. Um, as, in case of like in the rare circumstance that they make a mistake or they uh, violate the rule of law. That's it, thank you. Provina, are you, I think we've, we've unfortunately lost Provina. Um, maybe we could go to, uh, to Chris. Um, to follow up from from what uh, what Fazani was saying, Chris, you have the floor. Yeah, sure. Thank you, and uh, thanks for stepping in. Um, so yeah, just to uh, respond to Fazani there, uh, and I think uh, Sam mentioned it as well that uh, you know it's really important to have that cooperation, and with that cooperation, um, you can build in some checks and balances. Um, and as, as sort of Fazani mentioned. It's up to law enforcement to provide um, the right level of evidence and to do their due diligence and to provide that to whether it's the hosting provider, the registry, the registrar, um, the right information to allow them to make a balanced decision. Um, you know, the law enforcement will only come uh, if there's harm being caused. Um, and generally, we don't see essential services um, being compromised. However, it, you know it can happen um but so we need to ensure that we have the right thresholds um for taking the action that uh, law enforcement are recommending and um that the information that we are presenting uh is enough uh for someone to make an informed decision especially if that's um as sam mentioned someone working on a sort of voluntary framework um, rather than a uh, you know a, an international um, um, formal request via um, uh, an international letter request, which is a, uh, a, a court system uh, that we can use to provide um, legislative functions uh, internationally. So I, I think it's really really important we do have those checks and balances uh, in place and. You know, the last thing that we want to do is to cause 
more harm than we're, we're trying to prevent. So, um, and realistically, we can only get that by working together. Law enforcement have been trying really hard to be more engaged in this uh, area, in this community. Um, I'm sure in some of the other sessions um, throughout IGF, you'll have seen some other law enforcement colleagues. You know, we're represented within ICANN and it's really important that we take part in this multi-stakeholder process because it's only by doing that that we can, you know, effectively um, take action against some of these harms and provide those right checks and balances. Thank you. Thanks so much, Chris, um, and apologies for um, for dropping out for a moment there. It was almost like a demonstration of how problematic it is when you suddenly lose connectivity. <laughs> Thanks, Fazna and Chris. Um, I believe we have Manal next for an intervention. Uh, thank you, Rowena, and, and um, indeed good points uh, by everyone. Uh, so I, I just wanted to stress a few things that have already been said. First, Chris mentioned the timely response, and uh, I really wanted to highlight the importance uh, for governments and I'm sure for law enforcement, of course, to have uh, um, to have a response and, and to have a timely uh, response and action, of course. Um, that said, again, it's very important to have uh, the channels established between uh, all the different parties to make sure that uh, there is good communication and collaboration. Uh, of course, with minimum agreed uh, procedures, as Farzana mentioned also, but uh, uh, at least to have the flexibility to act upon the harm uh, that uh, may be of concern. And um, it would be very difficult to have uh, a rigid process that is really binary that could be followed easily. So uh, the, the communication, the collaboration, uh, what to expect, what is feasible, what is not, I think it's really important to have uh, these channels of um, dialogue and coordination uh, established and uh, open to ensure a timely uh, response and timely action. Thank you. Thanks very much, Manal. Um, so uh, for everybody in the room, just letting you know, we will have time for some Q&A. So do think about what questions you might like to ask of the panel. Um, and obviously same for the online uh, participants. If you put your questions into the chat, we can put them into the queue. If you're in the room, you can put your hand up. Um, Adam Peake is the, the on-site moderator there. Um, so we are Getting towards the end of this session and the, the final question that we had on this list to discuss was about the role of multi-stakeholderism in DNS abuse. Um, this has sort of been coming up as people have been speaking, uh, but I think it's worth focusing on it specifically as well. And I'm going to turn to Fazna first to, to respond to this question. Thank you. Um, right, that buzzword, uh, multi-stakeholder. So uh, why are we in the first place doing multi-stakeholder governance on the internet in general? And no, I'm not, don't, don't worry, I'm not gonna give you a speech <laughs> like for an hour. But I just want us to take us back to when they decided to design a multi-stakeholder governance for the internet. And what were the reasons behind that? The reasons behind that, one of the reasons behind that was that you could not operate the internet, some aspect of the internet, without the multi-stakeholder model. If you didn't have the key stakeholders involved, the operators, the, uh, the uh, telecom operators, the government, if you didn't have them involved, you could not operate the internet. So you would not have had the internet as we have it now. Or some, or, or some uh, crucial aspect of the, of the internet, such as what um, ICANN does, um, which is the uh, which is coordination of policy, global co coordination of policy for allocation of uh, domain names. So when we talk about 
um, why are we, first of all, when we are talking about DNS abuse, what DNS abuse are we tackling with this multi-stakeholder governance and why? Why do we have to do that? Sometimes it's, uh, I'm just trying to kind of prevent us from going through a multi-stakeholder theater that uh, will not yield results. So when we are thinking about, okay, so there are certain aspects of DNS abuse that has to be done through uh, multi-stakeholder uh, governance, because we have to interact with many other actors that are impacted or are uh, operating some aspect of this. So we need to uh, decide on that uh, first and not just do multi-stakeholder for the sake of uh, multi-stakeholder and because we have done it for so long. And uh, and also like checking whether the multi-stakeholder model, if this multi-stakeholder ICANN multi-stakeholder model is working for DNS abuse, have we even, even like, is this the right venue? Is ICANN the right venue? Is the right venue to actually do that? Because in botnet uh, mitigation, we have some kind of like network governance that a lot of actors are involved through a, a model that involves a lot of uh, stakeholders, uh, di different stakeholders. But that's not like necessarily uh, item. So whether we are having, whether we are using, and sometimes it is necessary not to use the uh, multi-stakeholder model. Um, well, and um, sometimes we want to not to, uh, like, you know, we, we want to do things contractually. Uh, and I was going to mention something like about the contracted uh, parties, the registries and registrars that uh, want to uh, negotiate with ICANN about their contract uh, about DNS abuse. And uh, also like mention that uh, maybe Sam can uh, touch upon this uh, a little bit, but whether um, that is some kind of like, a, are, are we doing this in a multi-stakeholder fashion? Are we changing the contract in a multi-stakeholder fashion? Or did we see the need not to actually go fully multi-stakeholder when it comes to DNS abuse? And the last point that I wanted to make, I'm sorry, I, I went on and on. Um, for the content, and for uh, the uh, trust and safety issues that we have on the internet for uh, service governance and content governance on the internet. Is the multi-stakeholder optimal? And in what circumstances is it optimal? Um, maybe, so for example, we have multi-stakeholder model uh, for trust and safety. I believe it is good for protecting an open, interoperable and global internet. Uh, because then we will have thresholds to act upon uh, things we won't, we will try not to act uh, at the infrastructure level and be more proportional uh, proportional in our actions to mitigate harm. Uh, but in what other circumstances can we have the multi-stakeholder model for DNS abuse uh, that can be effective, solve the issue, and also protect these core values of the internet and our fundamental right. That was about it, sorry. <laughs> no worries, Fazan, I thank you so much for that. I'm gonna turn to Sam next. I think that was a very good segue into um, talking about what's happening in ICANN at the moment. And then after that, I'll go to Nick to talk about multi-stakeholderism in the country code space. And then I think we'll go to questions, Sam. All right, uh, thanks Rune. And Farzane, thanks for bringing up um, the contractor party house proposal uh, that's going on within ICANN. So I'll just, to be clear, I, at this point, I am switching gears and speaking from my perspective as the chair of the registry stakeholder group within ICANN. Um, so we represent the interests of generic top level domain registries. So the GTLDs that have a direct contractual relationship with ICANN. Um, we're also working with colleagues in the registrars stakeholder group. So all of the ICANN accredited registrars, that's the interest group that they participate in ICANN through. Um, and in light of the ongoing conversations about DNS abuse and this question that the ICANN community has been grappling with about whether there is a role um, 
and what the role is for registries and registrars to play in mitigating and combating DNS abuse more broadly. Um, after, you know, considering this issue from a lot of different angles, including the, the appropriateness of acting at the DNS abuse, or sorry, at the DNS infrastructure level, as we've talked about kind of at length on this, on this panel, um, and like taking into account the limited remit that ICANN as an organization has, including ICANN's bylaws, which restrict ICANN from um, creating any regulations or passing any policy that restricts or governs content on the internet. Um, the proposal that registries and registrars within ICANN have come up with as a starting point is to make very targeted and um, focused changes to our contracts that would establish a kind of baseline requirement for registries and registrars to take appropriate action given their individual role and responsibility in this ecosystem on very clear cut instances of DNS abuse as that term is defined within the ICANN community. So I, I mentioned this at the earlier in the panel, farming, phishing, malware, botnets, uh, spam possibly when it's a delivery mechanism for the other types of abuse. And I think Farzne raises an excellent question about whether this kind of effort is truly a multi-stakeholder effort. Um, and I think that's absolutely worth diving into. What we're trying to do with this, um, these contract amendments is sort of really just lay the foundation and take an initial step within the ICANN space that then can be built upon by the multi-stakeholder community. We understand and we recognize, we've heard from ICANN's compliance department that they have a difficult time with the contracts as they are currently written with enforcing action to mitigate those clear-cut instances of DNS abuse. Um, there really isn't a hook in either the, re the registry agreement or the registrar accreditation agreement, those are the contracts that we're talking about, um, that allows ICANN to kind of hold to account those actors who systematically fail to take any action on those clear-cut instances of abuse. So really what we're trying to do with the contract amendments, and the reason we're keeping them so narrow, is really lift up that floor and establish at least the requirement that Okay, if you're presented with like well evidenced, clear cut, easily identifiable phishing, you got to do something about it, right? If you're a registry, maybe that means you're referring it down to the registrar, but you got to do something. <laughs> and so we recognize that this is not going to solve the whole issue of bad content online. It's not even going to solve the whole question of DNS abuse within ICANN's remit and within the ICANN space. And so I think there's a recognition on the part of registries and registrars that more community work will need to be done, but all of that work should go through a more robust multi-stakeholder process that is open, inclusive, transparent, and it brings to the table all of the, the different sure. interests and, and perspectives and stakeholders as far as I kind of laid out, right? Like that's the point of multi-stakeholderism, multi-stakeholderism. Um, and, you know, but that work kind of still remains to be done. So we're not trying to solve for all of that with these initial contract amendments. We really uh, do see this as kind of a, an introductory step and understand that more work will most likely need to be built upon it that should involve the larger community. So hopefully that uh, gives you guys an overview of kind of like one of the next steps that uh, we're taking within the ICANN space. Thanks very much, Sam. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to turn to Nick now to give us just two minutes on um, how multi-stakeholderism happens in a in country code spaces, uh, and then we'll go to questions, which I don't have any app lined up at the moment. So if you're um, in the room or online, please pop your questions in, put your hand up, approach Adam Peake, and we'll go there next. Yeah, thanks. I think um, it's interesting uh, as, as a, as a non-contracted party for the purposes of a country code, um, we don't have to follow the ICANN processes or ever get a, any um, attention from ICANN compliance, which is quite quite a nice thing from that perspective. But you still 
um, would be wrong if you thought that country codes didn't follow multi-stakeholder models. It's just that there's a huge amount of diversity. So what you'll tend to find is a microcosm of the global internet multi-stakeholder community within each um, jurisdiction. And I think that's certainly the case in most of the frequently used jurisdictions that, that I deal with. Um, certainly in, in the UK, we would do things in a very consultative multi-stakeholder way in terms of how we form our policies and then they will be publicly accessible so that um, people understand what our policies are, how we apply things, and we issue things like transparency reports so that people can see this is how many subventions we've undertaken, these are the agencies who have referred them, here's the complaints policies that you can follow if you have any sort of issues with overreach or undue freedom of expression, um, um, such type of thing. So I think investment by the infrastructure providers into the resources and staffing to be able to provide these sorts of avenues and information so that so that um, either victims of crime or public authorities know who to contact and what to do about any um, problematic uh, content or um, technical abuse of, of the internet, I think is a, is a, a very um, important point. And I think, you know, fundamentally, I think the whole industry is becoming much more proactive in terms of how to deal with their um, specific uh, issues and we we all talk to each other there are there are formal and there are informal approaches so that if you have an issue you should be able to find out what to do about it and who to report it to and it should then be actioned and that's really what I think we're all aiming towards is a proactive um, responsive and, and safe internet for everybody because that's what we're here for. Thanks very much, Nick. Um, I believe we do have some questions in the room, so I'm going to turn to our on-site moderator, Adam, to bring in those questions. Thanks, Rowena. Adam Peake speaking, and I saw two hands go up, so I'll begin with the gentleman on my right, and then Nigel Hickson, who I see further down the room. So over to you, if you press your key. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Chair, for the opportunity. My name is Tayo Pirakaremi, so I'm a member of um, NCSG, and um, I'd like to uh, re-echo what um, Vasenin actually raised about the fundamental human right uh, of registrant when we're dealing with um, DNS abuse. And um, when we're dealing with DNS abuse, we need to know that it's actually cut across the entire valuation of uh, DNS um, services. So um, my question would be, how do we involve registrant in uh, actually dealing with um, DNS abuse when uh, we're fighting DNS abuse and also uh, we also need to look at um, the technical role and the operational uh, measures when we're dealing with DNS abuse. So my question is how do we prevent for fundamental um, a right of the registrant in fighting DNS and how to include them in that process? Is there any due process um, within ICANN or outside ICANN? Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. I'm going to take both questions and then turn to the panel. So one on involving the registrant and human rights. Nigel. Yes, thanks very much. And uh, good morning, Nigel Hickson, uh, UK DCMS. Uh, first, first of all, just to, you know, thank you for this panel and uh, thank you for the DNS Abuse Institute and the INJ Policy Network and ICANN for all the work that's going on on this. There's a, a real focus, I, I, I feel, on DNS abuse culminating as what was just being discussed in the contractual amendments. But I, I suppose the question I had, and, and perhaps the first question is more important from my colleague across the room, but my question was, given the holistic nature of this issue and the fact that uh, you know certain types of abuse, which are very important to, uh, to, to, to citizens, uh, content abuse, which is not under the jurisdiction of ICANN, I mean, how holistically are we going to tackle this problem? Is there a, uh, is there a body up there that is going to, uh, is, is, is going to coordinate all this? Thank you. Thank you very much, Nigel. Anybody want first tips on the question about human rights and the registrant? Otherwise, I believe um, Ajit, do you want to respond to this question about content? If I can take the registrant one, I think in terms of okay, yep. if, if, if a registrant finds that they're impacted or have been 
um, they, they, they should be notified at the very minimum. So registrants should be notified if there's any ever issue with their domain name. Certainly we receive um, threat feed provider reports. And if, the, if a .uk domain comes up, then we will, you know, in the usual course, if we can see that it's a, a registrant who's got a compromised domain or is somehow caught up in something they may be unaware of, we will reach out to them and tell them that, try to make them in part of it. And then if they feel that they've been unfairly treated, then there are complaints procedures and transparent ways in which they can they can raise their issues to their publicly accountable authorities in our, in our jurisdiction. So it depends from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but but I think but I agree that sometimes you know the registrant is a very small part in a in a very big sort of complex machine, and it's difficult for them to um, exert any coordinated um, authority or know what's going on sometimes. But people need to provide that information at a minimum. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Nick. So um, a lot around due process there. Um, I'm going to turn to Ajit next. Um, for context, Ajit has been helping us with the moderation in the background, but was also absolutely crucial part of putting this panel together and designing what we were going to talk to uh, talk about today. Uh, so Ajit, would you like to come in? Thanks, Rowena. I just wanted to come in on, on the question that Nigel had raised on content abuse uh, or website content abuse and, and the DNS in particular. I think this is a very important issue, particularly from the perspective as as this is content abuses are rife in, in, in everyday society and there is an increasing pressure on sort of looking at what are the appropriate escalation paths to address it and what could be the appropriate thresholds or criteria at, at which point in exceptional circumstances action may be taken on specific website content abuses on um, uh, at the DNS level. However, it's very clear that this topic is outside the remit of ICANN, and there is a question about in what multi-stakeholder forum can this um, can this conversation be had, particularly on the, the definitions of, of principles and criteria and thresholds, and also what sort of content abuses can be addressed on, through the DNS, even in exceptional circumstances. Is it everything, or are there specific types of abuses that probably may not necessarily be ever remediated? And there are broad open questions, and there's a need for multi-stakeholder conversation on that. The Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network, along with the contact group, multi-stakeholder contact group, about 40 different actors, is trying to start addressing this topic purely from the perspective of principles uh, and, and hopes that many other multi-stakeholder initiatives can sort of use these principles to define specific thresholds and criteria and use cases for when limited action may be taken on specific types of website content of use through the DNS. Thanks, Rowena. Thank you so much, Ajit. Um, very speedy and concise there um, in true uh, panel fashion, all the questions flooded in right at the very end. Um, but thank you so much for participating, everyone. I think we better wrap up now. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists. Um, this has been a really interesting and insightful session and um, I really appreciate your time. Um, thank you to everybody in the room and online who joined. Um, we can, of course, continue these discussions uh, throughout the week um, and feel free to reach out to any of us. Um, thank you very much, everyone, and I hope you have a good rest of the day um, in Addis and online in the world, wherever you are. Thank you. And thank you to Rowena and Ajit Thanks. for organizing us and to Adam for uh, coordinating in the room. Yep. Thank you from the room. Very kind of you. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you. Everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, uh, may I use this opportunity uh, to just introduce um, NAMCOM, um, just to uh, tell you that the nominated committee will be hoping uh, application for um, leadership position in ICANN environment. For those that are interested, uh, please kindly check uh, NAMCOM uh, website in the ICANN um, uh, to know the, the, the roles that we'll be recruiting um, out for. We'll be recruiting for um, ICANN board. Um, of director as well as um, at large CCNSO and GNSO, please uh, kindly just look uh, look up um, NAMCOM website to uh, understand um, what um, we do and the kind of um, uh, position we look for and um, the quality of uh, uh, people. We're actually um, conducting outreaches um, to look for um, leadership position for the I ICANN board and other leader leadership position. So if, please, if you want to know more, please, I'll be you know, available to, to talk more about it. Thank you so much.